it's not that you know I never walk in fear or it's not that I'm always armed because my hands are registered weapons or anything like that. It's just that um, I, I get a little bit of relief from day to day. Welcome to Whistle Kick Martial Arts Radio, episode 170, and thanks for stopping by. Today, we hear from Sensei Jeremy Bays, a thoroughly entertaining martial artist. Here at Whistle Kick, we make the world's best sparring gear, and on Martial Arts Radio, we bring you the best podcast on the traditional martial arts, two times each week. Welcome. My name is Jeremy Lesniak, and I'm your host, as well as the founder of Whistle Kick Sparring Gear and Apparel. Thank you to the returning listeners, and welcome to those of you tuning in for the first time. You can find our show notes at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com, which is also the easiest place to sign up for our newsletter. As a thank you for joining our newsletter list, we're going to send you our top 10 tips for martial artists, which is an exclusive podcast episode. It's got some great content. We've got a lot of great feedback on it. So for those of you that haven't checked it out yet, go on over there. And something I haven't mentioned before, if you signed up for the newsletter before we put that out and you want to get it, just shoot us an email. Shoot me an email, jeremy at whistlekick.com. I'll make sure you get it. Our newsletter, in case you were wondering, keeps you up to date on what's going on here at Whistlekick. It gives you info on upcoming show guests, and it even gives you discounts on some of our products. We often hear from our customers that the no sweat t-shirts that we sell have quietly become one of their favorite shirts. They're 100% polyester with a relaxed fit and a lighter weight than similar shirts from other manufacturers who I will not mention. These tees are great under your martial arts uniform, gi, dobak, whatever you call it, or just on their own. I wear mine to the gym. Honestly, I've got a few of them and I wear them all the time. They're super comfy. We've got them in a number of sizes and colors and you can find them all at whistlekick.com. Sensei Jeremy Bays doesn't sound like your typical guest on this show, which is exactly why I was glad to have him on. While most of our guests have diversified their lives within martial arts, you know, studying different styles under different instructors, Sensei Bays took a different approach and he studies different pursuits entirely. With time in as a bow maker, a comedian, and a pastor, you can imagine the wanderings that some of our conversations took. Please help me welcome him. Sensei Bays, welcome to Whistle Kick Martial Arts Radio. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here today. It's a pleasure to have you. It's always a pleasure to get to to know our guests. Some of them I know a little bit, you know, some of the the more prominent people we've had on amazingly. I know of, but I don't know. And, you know, this is, for me, the best part of the show is getting to meet people and talk to them and get to know who they are. And that's why you're here today. So we can get to know you. And I appreciate well, the time. I'm looking forward to, to diving into my background and some of the things I've learned along the way and, and hopefully helping out a person or two as we're, we're uh, going through this process. Cool. I hope that happens as well. Let's get started. It might seem like a boring way, but it's always the place that we've got to start so we can move forward and have some context for who you are and why you started and all the other stories that you're going to tell us. So why did you start in the martial arts? My, that's a loaded question. I started when I was about nine years old, and um, I'm not sure why I started. It's one of those things that has always been a desire within me, always been there. It, I was never uh, really picked on as a kid. I was never uh, bullied or something and, uh, and thought, you know, hey, I need to learn martial arts to, to beat up the bigger guys or anything. It was, wasn't anything like that. It was just something I wanted to do. Um, I wasn't a, uh, a an athlete, so I wasn't a a sports person. So I didn't play baseball or, or football or something. And I found that this team sports just wasn't, wasn't in my blood, but I enjoyed individual sports. Um, I took a fencing class at the YMCA and thought, Hey, this is kind of cool, but it'd be great if I can actually really stab people. Um, and then, uh, uh, that led into, uh, uh, a boxing class at the YMCA. And I thought, Hey, this is fun, but it'd be nice if I can actually really hit somebody and not, hurt them obviously and and so um i found a uh, chinese uh, uh well, i'm sorry at that point it was an ed parker kimpo uh school um that was teaching oh halfway across town so i would uh, saddle up my uh schwinn and uh pedal it on over there about six o'clock or so and then stay until i was kicked out um saddle it on back home and uh practice my moves in front of the mirror and in front of the dog and in and um, 
Every time I said the words to my brother, hey, come over here, I want to try something, he would cringe and run. So that was uh, basically the, the very start of things. Um, goodness, that was probably 30-something years ago. Wow. One of the things that always strikes me is how often, how almost universal it is that budding martial artists have battles with their dog. <laughs> yeah, my dog has a fourth degree black belt because, you know, we've <laughs> we've we've done uh canine jitsu in the past. So. There you go. Uh, I've been known to practice some accuracy, some controlled accuracy on my cat who is <laughs> not too fond of it and uh I I've I've ended up with a few scratches from time to time as I get a little con overly confident of my abilities and my reflexes versus those of a cat. So <laughs> they can be a formidable opponents. I'm absolutely, sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. It makes me absolutely never want to tangle with anything larger than a house cat. <laughs> that's a, uh, that's probably a good idea. <laughs> so here you are, you start training, you're clearly into it. You're loving martial arts. It's, it's becoming something that you're so engaged with. You're practicing when you go home on the same nights that you're training. Right, right. What was it about martial arts that really clicked for you in that way? Because you're young at this point, and kids, while they definitely get into things, there aren't a whole lot of things that will keep a child engaged for that length of time. Yeah, we're talking 30-something years, so that's a long attention span, and, I, and most of the time, my attention spans is about 30 or 40 seconds, so you got got something going on there. Um, I, I, I watched the uh, Kung Fu movies. I've watched uh, probably every single one ever put out, I'm, I imagine. Um, Black Belt Theater on Saturday afternoons, that's where I was, and and. I looked at those, uh, you know, those flying jump, triple spinning back kicks and thought, well, I can't do that, but I can do something else. And so afterwards, it would be, um, it'd be another training session for me in the backyard or something like that. Um, it was never really that I uh, idolized martial artists like uh, Bruce Lee or anything like that. Um, they were kind of my childhood he heroes, but they weren't, they weren't who I was trying to be. I wasn't trying to impersonate them. Um, but um, it was just uh, just something that uh, clicked in my soul, and uh, I just uh, kept at it for 30-something years now. Great. Now, you're a listener to the show, so you know that stories are really the thing that kind of drives our format. We tell everything as a story. It was martial arts stories that I love that inspired that format. I'm going to put you on the spot now. Tell us your best martial arts story. I have a couple that, that come to mind. Um, so I'll tell you two real, real quickly. First one is um, I'm probably the only uh, – well, maybe not the only one, but I'm probably a rare case in that it took me 23 years to get a black belt. And um, that's basically <laughs> because um, I started out in the martial arts and I refused to take rank. Um, I'm not sure why I refused to take rank at that point. I just really didn't care. Um, it wasn't a pride issue. It wasn't a, you know, I'm going to be a white belt, but I'm going to kick everyone's tail. It wasn't anything like that. Um, it was just, uh, you know, I just, I didn't care. Uh, a belt was something to hold up your pants or tie your gi together. It wasn't really that big of a deal for me. So I was a, a white belt for five, six, seven years. Um, and then, um, I, I moved and then I started all over again. So I was a white belt again for five, six, seven years. And then, uh, I, I went to another place and, I've learned two or three systems are pretty close to them by that time. And finally, my uh, instructor, one of my current instructors said, look, I'm not going to be able to put a white belt out there teaching a black belt class. So we're going to have to do something. We're going to have to uh, have you just uh, do a black belt test and, and get your black belt, you know, earn it that way. You're ready to go. I can test you next week and, you know, we'll be good to go. And I said, no, that's not fair because uh, if I went from white belt to black belt, Everyone else is going to look at me strange or everyone else is going to think something's going on. Um, I'm going to go through the ranks. So if I'm going to get belt uh, ranking, belt ranked, I'm going to go through the, the, the ranks. And so at, at, at that point, it's about 18 years in. Um, I'm like, okay, I'll test for my yellow belt. Now I'll test for my orange belt. Now it, and so 
um, I went through those levels, including time in, because um, my instructor had uh, time in requirements at each belt level, you know, about six months here, a year there, whatever. And so by the time I was done, it was three years later that I had my first uh, showed on my first black belt. So, um, like I said, it's probably a 20 year path to get to that first black belt. Once I got it, I, I said, thank you. And I put it in a drawer and it was forgotten. Um, I think I passed that on to my, my daughter, um, not knowingly. She's in a program that's very much like Girl Scouts. It's uh, called American Heritage Girls. And um, she's uh, testing for like a equivalent of an e Eagle Scout or something of that nature. Um, and her uh, troop leader said, uh, how come you don't have all your, your patches sewn onto your sash there? She's like, well, I don't want to offend the other kids. I don't want them to think I'm better than them. And so I had to pull her aside and say, look, you've earned those. It's not a pride thing. Um, you need to display them, um, not to, not as a sign of accomplishment that says I'm better than you, but as a sign is that, that says that you can do this yourself. Um, kind of a, a mentor relationship and says, look, you can do this and I'll walk beside you. So that's that's one of my good stories. Another one. Very simply, I have a neurological condition called dystonia. Um, it is called spasmodic torticollis by some doctors or, or generalized dystonia. And essentially what happens is my head is tilted to the left. And uh, basically, if you take your left ear, put it on your left shoulder and hold it there for about 12 years, that's what you're going to see in me. Um, and so my head is cocked pretty much permanently to the left. Um, I, I tell people that my wife is left-handed and she just slapped me one too many times <laughs> or something. Um, yeah, in high school, I was kicked out of the Young Republicans Club because they said I was leaning too far to the left. Um, oh, have you seen that one movie, Sideways? No, I'm sorry. That's how I see every movie. Um, but anyway, um, that's my normal everyday posture. Now, it's getting better over time a little bit, but I'll tell you what. The reason it's getting better is because of my martial arts. Now, when I was young, I did these uh, martial arts moves and such, and my body remembered what it was supposed to feel like. My head remembers what straight is supposed to feel like. Um, and then uh, as I do these martial arts moves, even now, my head is uh, tilted, but I'll start my kata or I'll start my forms or I'll pick up an eskrima stick or I'll, I'll start some martial arts movements and my head will naturally straighten up because neurologically my body knows that's what it's supposed to be. That, if I'm hearing you correctly, so you're saying when you are not engaged in martial arts practice, mm -hmm. you still have the head lean. Correct. But the moment you go into doing movements that ha that you learned before this happened, your head corrects yeah. its position. That is 100% correct, yes. Wow. It, it, it naturally corrects. And I didn't notice it. It was someone else. It was one of my students. It says, you know, look, when you're instructing, when you're showing us these things, your head straightens up. And then I, of course, had to try it out and test it a few times, and they were right. So, and, and since that time, I found other people with dystonia that have said similar things. They were dancers, or um, one was a ballerina, and they found that once they did movements – that occurred before this uh, condition set, um, their head would revert back to a natural state. So it's kind of an interesting thing. It's neurologically uh, complex disease, but we're just beginning to understand the tip of the iceberg here. Mm. That's some really interesting stuff. And, and I'm sure that there's some indication of what could be done for a cure in, in yeah. that fact. You know, obviously I'm, I'm, no neurological researcher. I'm not going to be able to answer that question. I'm sure if you could, you you would have already. But that's fascinating to me. Right. That's de that's definitely one of the my treatments, if you will. And it's just a personal thing that I'll just go out and blow off some steam on a on a on a on a wooden dummy or on a punching bag or or on a kata or on a form and just um, uh, get a little bit of relief that way in several different ways. You're not the first person to come on the show and talk about how their martial arts training helped them with some kind of medical condition. We've we've had a few over the years. There are some others that will be coming on in the coming months. And the stories are all very unique, but fascinating in that common thread 
that weaves through. And it's, you know, reason 914 why having some martial arts training is a great idea, regardless of who you are. That's that's very true. It's not that, you know, I never walk in fear or it's not that I'm always armed because my hands are registered weapons or anything like that. It's just that um, I, I get a little bit of relief from day to day just because of my training and, and, and I get to blow off some steam and I get to build up some muscle memory and I get to just have some fun and, and I get to meet some great people along the way and I get to help people. And that's that's what I'm all about. Fun is a reason that I think we don't talk about enough in martial arts, we, we chalk up the the legitimacy, the reasoning for our training in almost every other way. You may be, and no, I, we've had a couple of, but certainly out of the hundred or so interviews that we've done over the last couple of years, you're one of only a handful of people that have said it's fun. So, oh yeah, there's a, there's I mean, a great reason. I, I wouldn't do it if it wasn't. I mean, why would you spend twenty years doing something boring? That's what it works for. Exactly. <laughs> what else besides martial arts are, are you into? Any hobbies or pursuits that really work for you? I have the attention span of a gnat. So um, anytime something shiny comes around, that's what I'm on. Um, I've been uh, an archer, doing archery, um, traditional archery, for, oh, goodness, about the, about the same amount of time as I've been doing martial arts. Um, and so I, I build my own bows, my own traditional bows and such. Um, goodness, I've, uh, I'm a swimmer. Um, I, I'm just, I do a little bit of everything, but sing. So, you know, that's right out. You, you and me both, nobody wants to be in, in the car no. if I'm belting it out. That's for no, sure. No, one, one time I cha I was uh, singing a song at church and three people changed religions. So, <laughs> yeah. Huh. I like that. Do you see a correlation between your archery practice and your martial arts practice? Yes, yes. The, the, there's there's three aspects of martial arts. I, I'm excuse me, three aspects of archery that correspond with the martial arts. You're going to do martial arts for one of three reasons: um, the historical side, the the personal development side, and then to me, just the fun side. And, and I kind of translate those into uh, the, the archery business as well. Um, I pursue historical texts. I pursue historical bows and historical patterns. Um, I, I do it for personal enjoyment and enrichment and, just, and also just to have fun uh, because it's something I enjoy. Um, but martial arts uh, – excuse me, archery has always been a martial art. And um, – Sure, we, we use it now to, to hunt, to bring food onto the table, to, to hit the bullseye, to score a point, whatever. But uh, just like the martial arts have the sports aspect, archery does as well. But it's always been at, at its core, at its essence, a martial art, a, an art of war. Um, and so I, I try to mimic some of those uh, those bows and the bow usage and the, and the patterns and such from uh, European – archers and as well as from North American um, uh, native tribes. Um, I spent a lot of time with the Shawnee. Uh, that's I'm uh, a Shawnee as far as my background. And I've learned some of their traditional techniques and their traditional bows and, and, and a lot, a lot like with the martial arts, it's an exploring process that you have to go through. That's really cool. Long time listeners know we've had a couple people on that, train in the historical European martial arts traditions and some of what you were saying about researching texts and digging into techniques and trying to pull some of that history forward reminded me a lot of them. Is the, is what you do as archery considered part of that movement or is this separate? It's, it's probably a fringe of that movement. Um, I have been uh, involved with the Western martial arts, um, as well with the German long sword and such. Um, and um, uh, what's called an arming sword, which would be the traditional archer's sword and, and a buckler. Um, but honestly, it's kind of a fringe uh, aspect of that movement. Um, we are involved in, in some reenactments. We are involved in some renaissance fairs. We all are involved in some tournaments. We are involved in some um, uh, period research and such. 
and so we we take a lot of our inspiration from our friends in the Western martial arts. But all in all, we're probably not uh, not the not in the same class, but we may might be in the same classroom. We've heard you use humor already quite a bit today, so I know that that's something that that a lot of people use, myself included, perhaps you, as you experience some of the lower ends of the, the less positive aspects of life. I'd like you to take a moment now. Tell us about a time in your life where things weren't great. Tell us about how your martial arts training helped you get through that time. Sure. As you said uh, earlier, humor has always been a, a big part of my life. Um, I am a sarcastic person by nature, and I don't mean that in a bad way. It's just that I like to uh, take jabs at, at life, and life has taken its jabs at me. Um, there's been times that um, that my bank account has been full. There's been times that I've really literally been wondering what I'm going to eat tomorrow. And without my martial arts training um, – my mentality there would have been just to sit in the corner and just say, woes me and, 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 and cry and whine a little bit. Um, with my martial arts training, my instructors taught me uh, what they called an indomitable spirit, never to give up. Um, there were times in which, honestly, I walked into my job and they said, you know, we're going to have to downsize and you're done. Um, and I said, okay. And I went out and I started my own business two days later. Um, why? Not because I really wanted to, it was because I was able to, um, because I had the tenacity and the willpower to do it. And I learned that in the martial arts. My uh, condition, my dystonia, has uh, caused tremendous, tremendous pain. Uh, when the doctors are doing these uh, uh, EK, uh, EMGs, um, sticking needles about like knitting needle sized things down into your neck. I'm pretty sure they're using a rubber mallet to tap them in or something. I'm not sure. But um, they're saying, you should be in excruciating pain right now. Why aren't you just doubled over in the corner? And um, honestly, I, I tell them, I said, I've, I've learned to deal with this because of my training. I've learned to, to put my mind somewhere else when the, the, the pain threshold gets too high. I've learned uh, just to, to kind of relax and, and go with it. Um, far too often, we fight things. People uh, that get lost in the woods, um, and they, they die. Why do they die? Well, because um, they start fighting it. If you're lost in the woods, to me, that's called a vacation. Um, you sit down, you chill out, you, you, you commune with nature in, that, in, a, in a way that just um, that connects you. And you have to do that with your own self. You have to do that with your own soul and your own spirit. And the martial arts help you to do that, and they should teach you that along the way. A really good attitude to approach life, for sure. And you and me both, lost in the woods is a vacation. Maybe not so much the loss, but at least being there <laughs> for a sustained period of time. That's my idea of a good time, without a doubt. Exactly. That, my best uh, vacation, you know, you go into the woods with a pocket knife and, and see what you can build. So. That's right. You've had the luxury, and, and I do consider it that, to train with a number of different instructors. I would say you're most likely a better martial artist because of that well-rounded uh, upbringing. Other than those people that when I say, who are your instructors? Other than those people that come to mind, who has been the most influential person <laughs> on your martial arts career? It's hard to go past your current instructors because they have such a huge impact on your life. Um, but honestly, I would uh, I would point to my brother. Um, he's he's the one that I said, uh, "Hey, come here for a minute. I want to try this." And he's like, "All right, here I am. What do you want to do? You want to break my arm again? Okay, let's try it this time." Um, and so he's always been there for me, and I appreciate that um, in him. Um, he hasn't been a willing uki all the time. He hasn't been a willing training partner. Sometimes it was he was ambushed on, you know, as he was finishing up his cereal or something in the morning. Um, when I was trying out my 
latest ninjutsu move or something like that. But but he's always been there as a, as a friend, as a, as a confidant, and I and I do appreciate that in him. So honestly, to answer your question, um, other than some of my current instructors, um, I would definitely say my brother has been a, a strong influence on on me and my martial arts background. You're certainly not the first person to name a family member as an answer to that question. I'm sure you're not going to be the last. We see so often in martial arts that it becomes a family affair, that quite often a child will join and then a parent will join. Sometimes it's the opposite. And quite often we end up with families of three, five, you know, six, seven people, and they all spend their time through martial arts. And I think that for those families, for a lot of us, Martial arts is a family, so to include your family in martial arts is important. You mentioned students of yours. I'm guessing you've seen the same thing in your school where it becomes a family endeavor. Most most definitely. Um, some of my uh, 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 co-students, I guess, is the English term for it. Um, some of the, the students that were, were training alongside of me that were, were family members, Um of, of my family and then members of their uh, of other families that came along and then uh goodness 20 30 years ago in indiana um i'm still in contact with people i knew 20 or 30 years in indiana so that's a, a wonderful feeling to have and you don't get that from uh the chess club or something you get that from from blood sweat and tears with with somebody else yeah for sure now if you had the opportunity to train with someone that you haven't and we'll open it up anywhere in the world, anywhere in time, so they can be alive or dead. Who would you want to train with? Okay. As I was thinking about this question, as when you were answering it, a couple things came to mind. First thing that immediately came to mind was that, that white-haired Chinese master that's in every martial arts movie. Uh, <laughs> you know what I'm you know you know who I I'm do. talking about. I, I do. don't know his name. I don't know what he, what style he teaches, but he's in every single Chinese martial arts movie I've ever seen. And I imagine he knows his stuff because he's in every style. You know, he knows White Crane and he knows Tiger and he knows Tai Chi and he knows a little bit of everything. So I imagine that guy would be a good choice to train with. Um, beyond that, someone who's actually not alive and probably never really existed um, historically in the way we know. But, you know, who's a better archer than Robin Hood? Um, that would be an awesome experience to, to go back in time and, and to find the, the, uh, the uh, beginning of this legend or beginning of the story and the, the person or persons who inspired it and say, hey, teach me what you know about the English longbow. That would be a fun, fun trip as well. So, mm. That's a pretty unique answer. We haven't had that one. Or I, <laughs> either, either of those two. And it, it's funny I that you bring up – probably isn't the guy who's in every martial arts movie is the old Chinese master because I don't remember which episode it was, but I, I just used an image of him f tied to one of the episodes lately. I'll, I'll have to find it and, <laughs> and put it in the show notes. Cause yeah, it, it's, it's a guy we've all seen for sure. Oh yeah. I think he's even in Kung Pao. So, I mean, if he can use hamster chucks or teach Kung that, Pao. you know, that's, that's oh. awesome. <laughs> There's a movie that some of us, wish was more discussed and others wish would just go away and never come back. And depending on my mood, I feel both of those things. Yeah. It's definitely something you have to be in the mood to watch. <laughs> it is. It is. Do you have favorite martial arts movies? I have a lot of favorite martial arts movies. Um, one of my all time favorites, the one I've seen a million and a half times is uh, Jet Li's uh, fist of legends. Um, the remake of, Bruce Lee's uh, Chinese connection. Yeah. Um, actually, I, I like Bruce Lee's version as well. But um, th that was just a great story. That was a, a great acting, and in my opinion, it was just a, a good all-around entertaining uh, martial arts movie. Um, the other thing is um, anything that Jackie Chan's in. I, I love his his uh, body dynamics. I love the way he moves. Um, but I also you know, he's one of the people that I've seen really use humor in the martial arts and, and use it in a, in a great way, a great, a positive way. And, and then also as just philanthropy, um, is just inspiring. So you, you can't help but love the guy for that. Totally. 
Now you mentioned Bruce Lee and Jet Lee. Are they your favorite martial arts actors or are there others that come to mind? Um, honestly, um, I like to sit down and watch a, an, an episode of Walker, Texas Ranger from time to time. Um, Who does it? Because, well, honestly, there's just times that you just want the good guys to win and you want the bad guys to get kicked in the teeth and you don't care about anything else that happens in the movie or in the uh, TV episode. And that's pretty much fills that gap. You know, the the uh, the story and such may not be uh, 100 percent. Uh, entertaining all the time, but sometimes you just you just want to see that that kind of action and 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 Chuck Norris is a, is a wonderful person and and I I, I love uh, love what he does I love what he stands for um, and um, I, I just want to support him that way too. Yeah, he's done a lot for the martial arts for sure. Yeah, and of course, someone that we would love to have on the show. I've done everything I can. Uh, he's kind of hard to get to. So if anybody out there has a direct line, a way to get Chuck Norris on the show, I will, um, I will be indebted <laughs> to you. I'll, 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 I'll come spend a week at your home, <laughs> mopping the floor, mopping right? the floor, or, or you know, resanding your deck, or you know, whatever it is. Let's let's get Chuck Norris on the show. Let's talk about competition. Sure. Oftentimes, by the time we make it this far into the questions, somebody, you know, our guests will bring up competition in some way. You haven't. So what does that mean? Does that mean competition is something you, you don't engage in, something that is old hat to you and you've moved on? What, what's your relationship to martial arts comp competition? Um. I lived in uh, Muncie, Indiana, and um, Muncie, Indiana had something called King of the Ring, and this was back before mixed martial arts were a thing or UFC or, or MMA or anything like that. It was basically they advertised it as a, a no-holds-barred martial arts competition, a no-rules thing, and being the young kid, you know, I think at that time I was 17 or so. I thought, you know, this is, this is be awesome. I'm gonna I'm gonna come into this uh, arena and I'm gonna dominate it, just like you know, blood sport with Jean Claude Van Damme or something. And um, I'll uh, I'll show them. So I went into that competition, a no holds barred, no rules competition. Uh, bowed in first match. The guys threw a nice roundhouse kick. Uh, blocked the the roundhouse kick. Kick pushed him away, and then he exposed his back. I pounced on his back, um, punching him two, three, four times in the kidney, doing a nice takedown, putting him down flat on his face, on his stomach, and, and pounding on his back. And they, they pried us away and pushed me out and said, hey, you can't do that. That's against the rules and such. And I'm sitting there honestly thinking, you just said it was a no rules competition. How can that? I, I don't get it. So. I could probably say as far as competition goes, I'm the only person I know that's been thrown out of a no-rules competition. But beyond that, I decided I'll give it a try, um, kind of the more traditional route, just a nice kumite uh, um, such. And so um, I did that for about two years. Um, did pretty well. Um, got a few first-place trophies that I can't find to save my life now. They might be in the garage. They might be in the trash. I don't know. Um, but it really never became a, a, a thing. Um, I did a couple of, uh, uh, weapons forms with a katana and one with the, um, comma that, uh, I, I didn't really learn a traditional comma form. What I did is I took some, uh, native American tomahawk movements and translated them into the, uh, the Japanese commas. And, um, Use it that way and actually got a second place, I think, in a uh, eclectic martial arts competition there. But uh, honestly, uh, competition is something I've kind of moved beyond in my own personal s development, basically because my body's moved beyond it. And, um, well, pretty much whatever it tells me, I have to listen to. For sure. All right. I do have uh, some students now that are training um, and and doing the uh, competitions, and I, you know, I support them and I I train them and help them be the best they can be. But uh, personally, I'm I'm not involved any longer. Got it. We talked about movies. Let's talk about books. Are you at all a reader, fan of martial arts books? <laughs> oh my. Um, 
Bruce Lee was once said that he uh, was once bragging and said that he had over 2,000 martial arts books in his library. And in 1960, I imagine that was a great achievement. Um, I don't even know there was 2,000 books printed at the time. Um, I went to my library the other day and said, okay, well, I'm not – uh, I don't have Bruce Lee's resources, but let me see what I have. And I counted uh, 200 and something books on my shelf. And then um, scattered across here, there's two or three on, at, at my bedside. There's two or three at the dojo. There's two or three loaned out to Bill and Bob and Joe and Sue and whatever. And so I probably have close to 400 books um, on the martial arts. Um, I love to read. I'm an avid reader. Um Anytime a new martial arts book hits the hits the press, I'm one that uh, wants to read it and review it and study it and learn it and, and, and ingest it and 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 have fun with it. I'm actually uh, kind of in the process of writing something right now, and um, so uh, readers are writers and writers are readers. So just going with that. Quite often, that's absolutely the case for sure. All right, this is kind of what we call our commercial time. Tell us what you've got going on. If people want to get a hold of you, if you know, if they're in your area, which we haven't even talked about where you are. I mean, <laughs> you know, so so kind of give us that whole shebang, and then we'll start to wrap up. All right. If you're in the East Coast or the West Coast or the North or the South of the United States, and you just find the direct center of the country, we're talking, you know, 100% direct center. That's called Topeka, Kansas, and that's where you will find me. Um, I am in Topeka, Kansas right now. Uh, you can get a hold of me online a um, couple different ways. My uh, archery website is woodlandarchery.com. That's uh, woodland, like the, the woods outside, archery.com. Um, or you can find uh, my personal ramblings and, and rants and such at ninjalama.online. Once again, ninjalama.online. Yes, everything I do has a llama in it, and I'm not sure why. Um, but that's what I'm known for. I, I'm the llama master, I guess. I don't know. Um, but I uh, would love to hear from you. I'd love to connect with people that are wanting to train or wanting to get together. Um, we run a small a small group out of the church basement. We're kind of the church ninjas, so to speak. Um, kind of a secret group down in an underground underground church group, I guess. I don't know. So, but uh, we love to have people come out and train. So if you're ever right in the dead center of the country, look us up and come on out. Sounds great. And of course, we will put links to those websites. Uh, I laughed. Hopefully, it didn't come through too loudly at ninjalama online. I think that's yeah. possibly the best domain name I've ever heard. So thank you for having that and for sharing that. The show notes for anybody that might be new to the show, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com is where we drop all that. So we're going to have photos and links and other things relevant to today's episode over there. We practice the deadly martial art of who spit on you. <laughs> oh. I, I could almost see a martial arts themed stand-up routine coming from you. I don't know if you've ever explored that, but I, I, I think it might have some teeth. <laughs> um, honestly, I, I have been a professional comedian in the past. Oh, okay. um, I, I was just guessing. I, I genuinely did not know that. No, yeah, 100%. Um, and people ask me, well, what's a professional comedian? I'm like, well, any comedian that gets paid in my book is a professional. So um, I've, uh, I've gotten paid. I've also gotten paid to quit. So, um, so yeah, it's uh, another thing I've done in the past. We could probably go off on, on quite the deep tangent, but so, a lot of the best martial arts instructors that I've known, not only have they used stories in their instruction, but they've used a lot of humor. And I think that people learn, people learn best when they're engaged. We know that. And I think storytelling and humor are two different ways to keep people attentive. Most most definitely. Um, if you're teaching them anything, anything from from algebra to you know taekwondo, uh, if you don't have a sense of humor, if it's a, a stoicism all the time, um, you, you're going to lose people at, at a certain point. Um, humor engages the mind; it activates certain areas in the brain that aid in retention. And so, if you're learning about uh, I don't know Windows 10, or if you're learning about uh, you know the 10th century BC. It, uh, it really does help make those things stick. That's great. 
what advice would you offer to the people listening? Winston Churchill, in a uh, in a speech given in England during the bombing of uh, London, said, "When you're going through hell, keep going." We've all been in in dark places. We've all been in in places where either we've just simply wanted to give up. We've all been in places where um, we've been kicked down. We've all been in places where it's just um, it's uh, our own choices that is bo- that have bogged us down. And so, honestly, the best advice that I can give anyone is to get off the X. Never stop moving. Always move. The X is is the you know X marks the spot. You're standing still. You're not moving. You're not going forward. You're not going backwards. You're not making progress. You're not regretting regressing. But when you get off the X and start moving, you start taking action. And whatever it might be, maybe it's your business, maybe it's your career, maybe it's your martial arts training, maybe it's your relationships, whatever. You're never going to see growth until you start taking action. I can describe my time with Sensei Bays in only one way. Fun. I had a great time talking to him, and I hope you laughed along with me. Talk about a funny man. His students are lucky, for sure. Thank you, Sensei Bays, for coming on the show. Over at WhistlekickMartialArtsRadio.com, you can find the show notes with some photos, including one he sent that, when I saw it, let's just say I laughed pretty hard. On top of that, we've got links to his websites and his surprisingly affordable handmade bows. You can follow us on social media too. Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, YouTube, Instagram. The username is Whistlekick. You should also check out our Facebook group, Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, behind the scenes. If you haven't shared an episode of this show with some of your friends, I'd appreciate it if you did it. That's Really, the best way for us to grow, we're growing, and thank you for helping us do so. If you want to check out those no-sweat poly tees that we've got going, whistlekick.com is the place to do it. Thanks for listening today. Until our very next episode, train hard, smile, and have a great day.